This module focuses on the 17th century Baroque style. During the 17th century, Europe endured a series of social and political upheavals involving civil war, revolts, peasant uprisings and a rebellion of the nobility. This resulted the formation of a form of stronger government, absolute monarchy became necessary. Trade with the Far East expanded. The oldest and best known oriental products were spice and silk. Cotton, a native product of India, also became very popular and soon became one of the major products shipped by the East India Company. Chintz was an important fabric for imports, a hand-painted fabric that was sometimes glazed. Oriental designs, both authentic and imaginary, were fashionable and were among the design produced on Indian chintz. Colorful Indian printed calicos made of cotton were also becoming popular in England. Women were willing to pay exorbitant prices for fine muslins from Bengal. In 1608, the East India Company set up a textile factory in Surat, India. These factories were armed outposts with their own government and military establishments. The company had in effect become a sovereign state. The Industrial Revolution started in England, partly as a result of attempts to mechanize production of English cottons so that they would be more competitive with the cheaper imports from India, which were threatening the English industry. The transformation of the textile industry was due to the increase in and efficiency of carding and spinning and in the perfection of completely mechanized looms. The spinning mule, spinning jenny, and the Arkwright water spinning frame had been developed by the end of the 18th century. The Industrial Revolution also led to the rise of the consumer society. Commercial interests recognized the benefits inherent in stimulating demand for customer goods and the ways in which the desire to follow fashion, not only in clothing, but also in furnishings, houses, and art objects such as pottery, fed the economy. The Baroque style, dated from the end of the 16th century to the middle of 18th century, is the name given to the artistic style that developed during this period. It emphasized lavish ornamentation, free-flowing lines and flat and curved forms. It was massive rather than delicate. The patrons included the Catholic and Protestant churches, the arist aristocracy and the affluent bourgeoisies. Clothing styles were affected by these changes in the arts and can be seen in the characteristic manner of bunching up of skirts when walking to emphasize the exuberant ballooning drapery. During the 17th century, the French court at Versailles was the hub of upper class social activity. Those of sufficient rank attended the king when he rose in the morning. The king lived most of his life in public, attended by his courtiers. The rest of his day was ritualized with the activities of each and every person carefully prescribed by court etiquette. Clothing was one of the major expenses for courtiers. This period also featured distinctive costume traditions. The Puritans were a conservative religious group of people who were resistant to change. Puritans followed the same styles as the rest of the population. They decreed excesses of dress and the wearing of more stylish clothes that was appropriate to one's station. Their clothing is often described as sad colored or drab. Wealthy Puritans wore clothing of fine quality but restrained in decoration and color than others. Puritan soldiers cut their hair shorter and earned themselves the nickname of roundheads. Cavaliers or royalists in England dressed in lavishly decorated costumes in vivid colors. The men kept long elaborate curls and wore a broad-brimmed flat-crowned hat trimmed with plumes. The Puritans favored a high-crowned narrower-brimmed cop copotains. The Spanish tended to be more conservative and prolonged styles like the ruff and the Spanish farthingale even after the rest of Europe had abandoned them. A variation of the style called garden fante was created. The skirt was more oval than the French farthingale with greater width from side to side. 
the bodice had a long white basque that extended down over the top of the white skirt. The bodice shoulder line was usually horizontal and showed similarities to necklines of costumes that were being worn in the rest of Europe. Sleeves were full and slashed to show contrasting underlinings and generally ended in fitted cuffs. Women wore high chopines of wood or cork to elongate this widened silhouette. Many garments that have survived from this period as well as works of art make up the largest part of the sources of information about costume. Painted portraits and drawings of everyday life as well as hand-painted fashion plates give us detailed glimpses of what clothing was like in the 17th century. For men, the shirt became less of an undergarment and more of an integral part of the whole costume. It was cut very full, was made of white linen and had a flat collar or falling band that replaced the ruff. Sleeve cuffs and collars were often of lace or decorated with cutwork embroidery. Changes in the doublet later caused the shirt to become more visible. Collars or bands were also detachable. These enlarged at the front to form a bib-like, often lace-trimmed construction. A long linen tie served as an alternative to collars. Towards the end of the 17th century, cravats, long, narrow, scarf-like pieces separate from the shirt were worn instead of collars. The doublet was worn over the shirt and tied to the breeches. The evolving forms had their waistline set above the anatomical waistline and had short tabbed extensions below the waist. This extension reached the hips. Some doublets had panes or slits through which the shirt or colored lining was visible. The doublet shortened, ending several inches above the waist. It was straight and unfitted. Sleeves ended at the elbows or were sometimes sleeveless. Towards the end of the 17th century, knee-length coats replaced the doublets as outer garments, called surcoats or just a core by the French and cassocks by the English. These garments had fitted straight sleeves with turned back cuffs buttoned down the front. They completely covered the breeches and waistcoat. Breeches were cut full throughout or cut more closely and tapering gradually to the knee, began at the waist and ended at the knee. The lower edge may be decorated with ribbons and lace. Petticoat breeches or rind graves were an alternative style to breeches. They were a divided skirt cut very full. Full wide ruffles attached to the bottom were called cannons. Towards the end of the 17th century, breeches were cut with less fullness and ended at the knee. The vests were introduced by the English king Charles II in 1666. It consisted of a below-the-knee length coat and what we refer to as a waistcoat of the same length, worn over the narrow breeches. Men wore capes and cloaks with wide collars for outdoors. Circular capes were hung over one shoulder which, and were secured with a cord that passed under the wide collar. It was called balagni in French. Cassocks or cassacks were coats with very wide, full sleeves that were wide throughout the body and ended at thigh length or below. Men wore their hair long and curling. Later, some men shaved their heads and wore long curling wigs. Beards were trimmed to a point. Moustaches were large and curled. Men grew a lock, called a love lock, of hair longer than the rest. Large brimmed hats had full feather plumes. Towards the end of the 17th century, wigs grew larger. The hair built up on top of the head. Some wigs were dusted with powder to make them look white. Hats were superfluous and were more often carried under the arm than worn. A tricorn hat was a flat hat with the brims, brims turned up at three points. For footwear, both shoes and boots were worn. These had high heels and straight soles. Slap shoes were a flat shoe attached only at the front and not at the heel. These soles slapped the ground as the wearer walked. It was intended to keep the heel from sinking into soft ground. Boots extended to the knee. High rigid boots made of heavy leather made for horseback riding were called jack boots. Stockings were worn with breeches. 
shoes with large open sides and extensions called latchets that tied across the instep, instep were worn. Shoes had elaborate rosette ribbon and buckle trimmings. Galoche is a flat soled overshoe with a toe cap for keeping it in place. For women, the undermost garment was the chemise. Gowns were made with bodices and skirts attached at the waist, which were slightly elevated. Styles that opened at the front were usually one of several layers. The outer layer was worn over an underbodice. Bones stiffened garment like a corset that had a long U-shaped stomacher at the front and this filled in the upper part of the ground. Later bodices lengthened and narrowed, becoming long-waisted and more slender with an extended V-shaped point in the front. Separate skirts were worn under the gown. The French called the outer layer the modeste and the under layer the secret. Some outer layers of skirts were pulled back into puffs or looped up over the hips. Decorations for gowns often consisted of a row of ruffles down the front or lines of jewel decoration or braid on top of seam line constructions. Towards the end of the 17th century, skirt layers had become so heavy that additional support from whalebone, metal or basket work was required. A new variation called mantua or manteau in which the bodice and skirt were cut in one length from the shoulder to hem. It was full in both front and back and was worn over a corset and an underskirt for casual wear. But for formal wear, it was pleated and belted to fit the body. Jackets could be worn in combination with skirts. These jackets had short tabs or basques ending below the waist. Jackets worn at home were often quilted, looser in fit than fashionable dress and without elaborate sleeve constructions. Sleeves were often very full on gowns and jackets, were puffed out and frequently painted. A style variation of sleeves that were painted and tied into a series of puffs was called virago sleeves. Most sleeves were set low on the shoulder, opening into a full puff that ended below the elbow. Necklines tended to be low, some V-shapes, some square and others horizontal in shape. Stiff ruffs had been replaced by falling ruffs, which were gathered collars that sloped down from neck to shoulder, or wide collars tied under the chin with strings. Horizontal necklines were often edged with a wide, flat collar that looked like a Bertha collar. Frequently edged by a wide lace collar or band of linen called a whisk, necks tended to be low and horizontal or oval in shape. Towards the end of the 17th century, necklines revealed less bosom and became more square. Corsets were also visible at the front of the bodice. They were heavily decorated, ending in a pronounced V at the waist. Separate stomachers could be tied or pinned to the front of the corset to vary the appearance of a dress. Capes cut full with flat turn-down collars were worn for outdoors. Some were lined with fur. Coats cut like men's cassocks were worn for horse riding or walking. Long broad scarves were placed around the shoulders as were lappets or short waist length capes. Hair and headdress. A part was made behind the ears and the back hair was drawn into a roll at the back of the head while the front hair was arranged in a curled lock around the face. Women went hatless and also wore a cavalier style hat and copper chains. Small squares of fabric were also tied under the chin or sewn, pinned or form a cap. During the later part of the century, hair was built up high on top of the head with long curling locks at the back and sides. On top of the hair, women placed a device of a series of ruffles held in place with wire supports and known as the fontang in France and commode in England. Shoes were similar as those described for men. Shapes changed as shoes became more pointed at the front and the heels became higher and narrower. Brocades and decorated leathers were used for fashionable shoes. Women used ties to tie up their shoes. Pantofles were heelless slippers or mules. Women also wore hand and machine knitted stockings that were made of wool or silk and had knitted or embroidered decorations. Accessories included gloves and these were worn by both men and women and were sometimes scented with perfumes. 
They also carried handkerchiefs and purses. Women carried fans made of feathers or of the folding type as well as muffs made of silk, velvet or satin and even fur. Women wore face masks to protect against weather or to engage in anonymous flirting. Aprons, the practical cotton or linen varieties, were worn to protect the garment beneath as women went about their household tasks. Decorative ones made of silk or lace and lavishly embroidered were worn as an attractive accessory to fashionable dress. Men wore neck chains, pendants, lockets, rings and even earrings. Women wore necklaces, bracelets, earrings and rings. They also placed mirrors and pom pomander balls around their waists on chains. Makeup and cosmetics were used by both men and women. Lead combs were used to darken the eyebrows, paint and powder to tint the face. Some women colored their fingernails red. Patches, a small fabric shapes were glued to the faces to cover imperfections or skin blemishes. Women wore night masks to soften the skin and to remove wrinkles. They even placed plumpers, small balls of wax in the cheeks to provide the face a fashionable rounded shape. In earlier times, children, once relieved from their swaddling clothes, were dressed in the same styles as adults. In the 17th century, the nursery age boy was first dressed in the same dress style as girls, who were dressed like small women. Later, the boy was dressed in a long robe that buttoned at the front. When he turned six or seven, he was dressed in adult male styles. Infants were swaddled, tightly wrapped in bands of linen that inhibited movement. Christening robes and accessories remained the same throughout most centuries. Infants unable to walk were dressed in long gowns called carrying frocks. Children old enough to walk wore shorter dresses called going frocks. During the 17th century, aprons or pinafores replaced bibs. A mckinder, a kind of handkerchief, was pinned to the front of the dress for extra protection.